All right, good morning. Uh, why, why don't we get started? <clears throat> so, uh, hello, my name is uh, Mark Alvidrez, and I am a site reliability engineer at Google, and I've been there for roughly uh, a, a dozen years, which is crazy. I never thought I would be in a single company for 12 years. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about um, building reliable social infrastructure. Uh, and uh, th this is how I spent the last three and a half years, uh, roughly uh, working on problems of, of building infrastructure that's well suited for, for social application. I, I know that there's a bunch of people in the audience who have experience with this. Uh, I'm not going to claim to have the, the final word in this, but I, I will say that we built some really interesting systems and, and had to deal with scale. And, and I am, I'm here to share with you guys what, what we've learned uh, so that you, you, can, you can build uh, similar systems yourself. So, you know, when I started to go into this space, uh, I, I, I went into social in part because I thought that the design space was really interesting and, and there were a different set of problems uh, than, than you see in a lot of traditional distributed systems. Um, so, you know, like, I, as, a, as a system designer, there are a number of things that, that I try to avoid. And you know, the, they're the things here on the left-hand side. Um, you know, if I can avoid it, having globally mutable state that requires that semantics and, and uh, a very high update rate, I, that's something I'd like to avoid. I'd like to avoid having <clears throat> a, a large serving data set that has no natural partitioning uh, partitioning dimension. Uh, I like to avoid uh, requiring access to particular pieces of data at, at dramatically higher rates than other pieces because that tends to produce hot spotting in your storage system. Um, and you know, if at all, I'd like to avoid uh, having to provide interactive latency to a global user base. Um, the thing that I realized was that these sort of like uh, distributed system design anti-patterns are exactly the patterns uh, for the products themselves. So for, uh, for, for, for mutable data, you, you, you want to have, for your, for your product, you want to have instant updates that everybody sees all at once. Uh, a, a social, a, a, like a well-connected social system um, has at its core a, 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 a set of data that's really hard to partition. Um, you, want, uh, you want your data to sort of flow and, and uh, become excited or, or uh, circulate rapidly and, and widely. This is viral data. Uh, and you want to be fast for every user in the world all at once. So the, the design anti-patterns of a system become the, the desirable products, product features for that system. So these these are products that I, I'm I'm sure you're aware of. It's you know Twitter and it's uh, Facebook and it's also YouTube and it's uh, Strava, the the ride you know uh, bicycle riding and running app where you know when I log in I, I see a list of things that my friends have done and you know they give me kudos I give them kudos like the the social features of applications are showing up everywhere um, outside of social networks and within. So you you may be asking. You know, at Google, was social infrastructure really about just Google Plus? And the answer to that is a, is a resounding no. Um, one of the goals of Google Plus was actually to build a set of infrastructure that could be used to, to make any and all applications like Google social. Uh, and so that means that we built generic infrastructure to solve problems like uh, unifying identity and um, social graph serving and handling a high mutation rate on a graph, uh, social notifications, content storage for the social systems, and then fine-grained access control. And being that this was, these were Google applications, we're talking about serving you know, millions, 10 millions, hundreds of millions of users. So we really needed to sort of dive in and solve those hard design problems uh, and do it in a way that, that would really scale. <clears throat> so we built this infrastructure, and it's showing up in, in different places that you may not be aware. So for example, the commenting system that we built is used in YouTube, and it's one of the options for Blogger. The identity and social graph components are core uh, parts of YouTube and Hangouts. Um, and the per permissions and access control systems we built for, for Google Plus form one of the core underpinnings of the IAM uh, access model for, for a cloud itself. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is a number of uh, 
<clears throat> what I think of are, are particularly interesting areas of the design space uh, and, and talk about the idioms of, of the social systems and, and the, what we learned in, in, in sort of various iterations as we built the infrastructure. So the, the first part I'll talk about strong consistency and data partitioning. And this is really about scaling and how you scale a, a, a socially enabled system. The second part is about uh, da data storage layer hotspotting, which is about viral content and how you handle that. And then the last I'll, I'll talk about about uh, low latency for a global user base. Um, so as I said, strong consistency and data partitioning in, in many ways is about how you scale the system. So what, what do I mean by scaling for a social system? So social systems scale in a number of interesting dimensions, certainly by number of users, but also by number of edges in the social graph, by number of data items that you serve, the amount of usage per user per item, um, and the access control relationships. And we needed to be able to scale all of these things while, re while retaining the kind of uh, latency profile of an interactive server. Um, so uh, so to, to, to sort of describe a little bit about um, you know, how scaling a, a socially enabled system is, is a little bit different than a typical distributed system, I'm going to do a whirlwind to a tour of, of you know, sort of basic scaling. So we start with a server. It has a set of data uh, represented by the yellow square there. Um, all is well and good. Until you run out of capacity on that server, we all know how to solve this problem you replicate, right? You, you have multiple copies of the server with the same data set with a load balancer in front of it. Um, so you have success, your data grows, and your data grows some more until it can't fit on a server. So can anyone you know, sort of tell me what, what's a common way of addressing the problem of running out of space to, to fit your data on, on each of the instances? Sharding, sharding, which is also known as partitioning. So um, you look at your data set and you say, you know how can I split this data set into pieces? Either you know, maybe it's in dictionary order, maybe it's some structured data, or, or maybe you want to distribute it in, in a random fashion using a hashing function. Uh, so a trivial example, you have a, a, a bunch of names. <clears throat> you have a bunch of names. You know that they're going to grow. Uh, they're not going to fit on a single server anymore. So you break them apart and into multiple pieces. And so going back to our example, we have a bunch of data. It's going to grow. It's not going to fit on the server, so we, we partition it or we shard it. And then if you run out of capacity that way, you can replicate the shards. So how does this apply to a traditional distributed system? Well, let, let, let's look at search. So for search, the use case is actually really easy, right? Um, because you have a, a large read-only data set. The partitioning function is very straightforward. You can partition by URL. You can partition by hash. Uh, it has a tree structure, which scales nicely, both in terms of data set size and also compute associated with that data. Um, you don't need global identical consistency. You can have multiple copies of the internet spread around the world and do searches on them independently. If they're not all in sync, that's actually not a big deal. Um, provisioning is easy. You add more copies. And emergency, re emergency response is also pretty straightforward because you can bring those coffee, copies offline. And, you know, to, to be clear, a, a lot of social data sets actually partition really nicely, like posts or comments. Um, these things actually break apart into really nice pieces. Um, one thing that doesn't break apart into nice pieces is the social graph itself. And, and really, if you think about it, a social graph is a, a, a directed or undirected graph whose point is to sort of create a set of interconnections. Uh, and you might think like, oh, well, you know, you can just sort of draw a line through through the, through the edges, right? Well, you, you can't, because not only do the nodes hold data, the edges themselves hold data as well. They, are, they, they provide information as well. You might, you might, for example, have a node that represents a social group, and the edges connected to that node represent the access or, or membership within that group. So there's really no clear uh, partitioning function. Um, so if, if we can't partition, then can we use the other strategy? Can we replicate the data to make it easier to serve large amounts? Um, well, you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, in many cases, the answer to that is no, because the the mutations that you apply to the to the graph are actually privacy sensitive actions. So. Uh, in, in social networks, there's a, there's a common set of problems known as the new friend or new enemy problem. Um, and starting with a friend, 
Uh, say that you, you, know, you connect to someone or you reconnect to someone, you snap a picture, you add them to your social net network and you blast it out to your friends and say like, hey, check it out, look at who I met. Well, you want that post, that, that picture, to actually go to the person you just added to your network. So you can't really accept much in the way of propagation delay across, across a set of replicas. Similarly, if you have a new enemy, uh, Alice and Craig were friends, they had a fight. Alice unfriended Craig and then sent out a note saying like, can you believe what Craig did? Well, she doesn't really want Craig to get that, right? So, you know, like having delay in that system is, is actually um, potentially very problematic. Um, similarly with, with blocks, if you block a user, that block should be from that point in time and forward, it shouldn't sort of come and go again as the, as the, the information about that block propagates through systems. So um, really, most mutations on the social graph are really unsuitable for, for eventual consistency. They're things that, that actually require strong consistency. So is everything lost? Does everything need strong consistency? Well, no, I gave some examples earlier, but then also um, there are lots of things that can be safely estimated or, or that can propagate out eventually. So view counts or reshares or plus ones, all of these things are, are you know, reasonable to sort of uh, estimate to get into the right order of magnitude. Um, even the posts themselves, you know, in many cases, uh, if, you, if you are a user and you miss a post, we missed it because it didn't replicate to a new data center, um, we can show it to you next time as long as we've kept track. So um, there, the, the key parts here are to really understand the, the, the data and understand the requirements of that data. Um, make sure that, that you apply strong consistency to the minimal subset of things that need it and no more, and then look for opportunities to use partitioning and eventual consistency on the other sets of data. Um, this really is different than, than most distributed systems because um, you have these core parts of the application that really aren't partitionable and, and need that kind of strong consistency. Um, Let's talk about uh, data storage layer hotspotting, which, which is really about virality. And for this, uh, I'm going to use an example, an extended example of a, a stream of social actions. So this might be your, uh, your news feed in Facebook or your list of plus ones or, or that, that list of sort of rides and, and uh, kudos that were given out to me in, in the Strava application. Um, so it's widely implemented. Uh, I think everyone in the room should be familiar with it. You tend to have sort of personalized views of the data based on what your, what your graph looks like or, or based on the site. Um, this might be the structure where you have a bunch of posts and you have a bunch of comments and there's a tree of comments that, that, are, that are in the post. This, this should all be very familiar. Um, so first question, how do we serve data like this efficiently? Um, it turns out that if you can implement your data layer as an immutable layer, um, then it's actually uh, a really well suited for an eventually consistent data store. So you can uh, write once, updates uh, uh, get written as new items, and pointers get updated to point to the new item rather than to the old item. Uh, and you don't need to su support read, modify, write semantics, which are one of the really tough things to get right in an eventually consistent data store. Um, the performance requirements, I think, are what you would expect. You need to support a high read rate, uh, write rate that's lower than that, uh, where the latency of reads are much more important than writes. Um, and many of the early systems that we implemented, social systems at Google, were implemented on uh, Bigtable, which is a NoSQL, eventually consistent data store. So here, you, here I've uh, created diagrams of a couple of common configurations for how to actually structure serving this data. So you've got um, you know, the, the, the source of the requests in the cloud, you've got a load balancer, you've, you've got a business logic layer, and then you've got a bunch of, of storage servers on, on the edges. So uh, common, common layouts of the data would be, you know, so for, for diagram one, you've got uh, where you, a case where you store each entity, each post or comment um, separately uh, in the leaf nodes of the system. Uh, the, the other common way of doing this is to group the posts and comments into sort of buckets that are per user. Uh, and I'll go through each of these to talk about the pros and cons. So the, the first one where you store each entity independently, another way that goes by is, is a read fan in system because essentially when a user shows up and they want to read content, um, they have to re they end up getting uh, posts and comments from many of the leaf nodes. So you're fanning in the requests at read time. 
Um, this fan in tends to do wonders for your tail latency. It's actually really horrible for tail latency um, because only you know one of your systems has to be slow in order to slow down the entire request. Um, writes, on the other hand, are super cheap, right? Like they go to one place, you, they write to one server, you have sort of redundancy underneath that server so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, losing copy of the data. Um, but they're, they're really cheap. And also, um, the, this is a, a storage space efficient solution. It scales with the number of entities that you have. So this is a read fan in system. So contrast this to another common idiom that you see, which is a write fan out system. And this is one where as, a, as new posts come in, you actually fan them out and write them into buckets that are per user. So if I were to make a post and it goes to 10 users uh, at write time, I would write that into the, the sort of buckets of each of those 10 users. So this is sort of the flip of, of the read fan in system. Writes are very expensive. They have poor tail latency. You have to deal with partial success and failure. It's, it's, it, it becomes you know, difficult to, as the number of writes goes up. Though reads are super cheap. So the most common thing that happens is a user comes, they want to see what they have, they read their bucket, and you know, it, it all goes very quickly. Um, the storage space used here is less efficient because you've got um, <clears throat> the number of entities times the roughly the network density or how often those entities get replicated. Um, so it's, it's not quite as efficient. So which do you choose? Uh, in, in some sense, the question comes down to what you want to be expensive. What are you optimizing for? So uh, a write fan out system, maybe the ultimate expression of, of a write fan out system would be an email inbox. You know, this is how email works. You, we, you send a message, it gets duplicated and written out to each of, those, each of the users who receive it. They're able to read their inbox. Um, so reads are cheap, writes are expensive, um, and being a store and forward system, the, the fact that writes are expensive is really not that big a deal. Uh, and storage is expensive. For a read fan in system, maybe the ulti ultimate expression of that would be uh, a distributed structured database, something where you actually need to go out and get responses from every leaf node in order to construct the, the proper uh, uh, response back to the user. Um, we tend not to have to have that kind of tolerance in a social system. Like there is some acceptability for, for lossiness, uh, but um, that, that I would say is, is, is the ultimate expression of a read fan in system. So writes are, are, are cheap, reads are expensive, uh, and, and storage is cheap in that case. Um, the, either of these are reasonable solutions for, for many types of social problems. Um, where they tend to fall down is, is that uh, in, in the case of outlier users. And these show up increasingly as your, as your social network or as your social system gets popular. So who are the outlier users? Well, uh, there are two types, celebrities and super followers. So celebrities are something that everybody understands. They tend to have orders of magnitude more followers than the median user. Uh, and they tend to have very atypical, atypical interactions. Um, uh, maybe they, they write infrequently, or they have someone who writes for them, or, or, or something like this. But they're very valuable users because they tend to draw in a bunch of other users into the system. So you don't want to piss them off. The other type of, of sort of um, outlier user um, we call the super follower. And this is someone who is super active on your system. They tend to follow uh, orders of magnitude more people than a, than a typical user. So if a typical user has 50 friends, this person may have 5,000 friends. Um, and this stresses the system in, in, in the other dimension. Uh, so, you know, in, in the case of celebrities, if you're using, a, if you have a write fan out system and you, you write, they write a message and it goes to millions of users, you know, that, that's pretty horrible. Similarly, a super follower has terrible experience if there's a read fan in system and they're pulling in data from every single leaf node. Um, you're, you're surely going to get, you know, slow response times. Um, the super followers, though, tend to be really engaged and really like your product, and they, they make it better for everybody else. So you don't want to piss them off either. So um, in, in cases where neither of the naive solutions work, uh, we, we've had to, in, in many cases, implement uh, basically what is a hybrid. <clears throat> so the, the hybrid system uh, is one where we use write fan out for typical posts so that we collect the posts for a user to make the read experience really good, um, but we handle celebrity posts differently. And for those, we replicate them 
um, separately from the rest and maybe put them on all the storage nodes so that a, a given read will pull a user's data and then also celebrity data that's associated with that user. Um, so you, your reads, you, you end up multiplying, you have multiple reads instead of a single read, but, but actually a small number of them. So the, the, the effect on the tail isn't too bad. Um, the writes get much better. The writes are, are sort of um, what you would expect for a write fanout system except for celebrities, which is the anti the, the sort of pessimal case there. And there, you're just doing a simple replication. And you might have a separate set of infrastructure to actually support writing and reading celebrity data. <clears throat> and this, this is also sort of a, a, a good use case for the super follower. For the most part, um, they're going to have a, a bounded latency experience. And they're going to have a better experience with your product. Um, in terms of storage space, it's less efficient than, than um, <clears throat> than read fan in, but, but more efficient than write fan out. It, it falls right in the middle. All right, so that's now that we've got a, a, a nice storage system that um, uh, we've, we've got a nice storage system that, that, that will scale nicely for uh, your typical users and, and your outlier users, uh, we have another problem that users present to us, and, and that is. Um, and that is this. Who, who can, who, does anyone in the room remember what happened uh, on May 25th, 2009? Something that would cause a query graph that would look like this? Yes, Michael Jackson. That was the day that Michael Jackson died. And indeed, um, this is, uh, I think, a really excellent example of how you end up with a, a median level of request that's much, much lower than what you see at the peak. Uh, and this, this sort of graph showed up in our search queries, in our news systems, and on our social networks as well. This showed up everywhere uh, as, as people were sort of um, uh, trying to find out what had happened. So this is the atypical use, atypical use case. So what does typical social data look like? So what we tend to find across different social systems is that you can divide the data into young data and old data. Young data is, is data that was recently added to the system. Old data is stuff that's been around a while. We see the vast majority of activity on young data. And old data, over time, becomes to dom comes to dominate a long tail of your, of your bytes, right? Um, but if you take a look at the graph here, this is uh, on the left, you see the fraction of blobs, which is uh, the, the way that we store photos. And on the bottom, you have the days of photos in activity. And you see that <clears throat> the older photos, it, you see a nice drop off of, of access as the photos age in time. And this kind of pattern shows up all over social data sets. Um, so viral popularity is, is like the Michael Jackson case. And what we talk about is, is having a large variance in demand. And the variance there is the difference between the median request rate as measured in request per second and your max request rate. And so uh, a big difference means that you have high variance. And, and that's, that's the problem we have to solve. Um, but do we have to solve it? Well, why is that important? Well. Um, I'll get to that in a second. First, let me let me go through some data. So this is this is a, a, a an example of the distribution of requests for posts. So these are uh, on on the left. You have requests per second starting at zero, going to five thousand requests per second, and on the bottom you have the number of posts or comments. Uh, that that get, that see that kind of request rate. So we have you know six million and change requests that see between zero and one request per second throughout that day, and then we have some amount at the top, and it's really small. You can't see it here. You you can't see it unless you go to log scale, and then you see that we have you know a, a, a small change of thousands of of requests that actually are really popular. Say you know five hundred requests per second and above in a in a given day. So the reason that this matters <clears throat> is that it has a, a direct effect on how you size your storage layer. So in the example above, or the example that I, I just talked about, you know, imagine that your average post is 20 kilobytes. Uh, and you have serving systems that have, say, a gigabyte. Uh, they'll serve a gigabyte of data. Well, if you take the, the number of posts that we have and, we, and you divide it by the you know, one gig, and uh, um, you find that, that in order to sort of hold the data for serving, you need about 175 servers. Uh, assume for a second that those servers each can handle 10,000 requests per second. So for the non-viral posts, which is 99.94% of posts in that example above, um, the, the peak request per second that you see in a day is 368. 
for viral posts, which represent 0.06%, the peak that you see on each of the servers is 66,000 requests per day. Uh, and the way I got to that was to you know, take the number of, of viral posts divided by the number of servers, and that would end up with an average, average of you know, 33 on a given server. The, the diurnal cycle means that your peak is gonna be sort of roughly double what your, what your median is uh, for the day. Uh, and so to serve this load, we'd have to sort of expand our, our server base from 175 servers to about 1,200 servers, which at the storage layer is, is a really significant investment. So, how do we address this? Well, um, as probably wouldn't be surprising to a lot of you, caching. <laughs> caching is the solution to many, many different things. So we added caching at the storage layer. So popular posts would, <laughs> would, would not need to go to a backing store. We added caching at the business logic layer. Uh, and then critically, we added a caching layer, a stateless caching layer between the two of them. And by stateless, I mean that um, the requests from the business logic layer are sprayed sort of at random across this set of cache servers. And the cache servers we use were, were the moral equivalent of memcache. Uh, and so you do a quick check, is this in cache? If not, you do the fetch to the base storage system, return the response to the user, and then update the cache so that the next time someone might find it. Um, the, the trick for us was to, was to figure out how to balance uh, the, the freshness of data for capacity. So what we did was we, we, we used uh, variable TTLs for managing the caching. So things that were requested not very often got a short TTL. So if there was an update, it would quickly be updated. If things were, uh, uh, if things were, were requested often, we would increase that TTL. And what that means is that they'd be held on the cache servers more uh, over a longer period of time, uh, and that means that the capacity to handle the peak of the viral request actually um, gets to uh, uh, the size of your caching layer and not the size of your underlying storage layer. And so we were able to effectively trade off freshness for capacity. Now, a key question in our world is, is this a capacity cache? And I'm gonna leave that as a question for later uh, you, you, for, for folks to discuss after the talk. So uh, storage layer hot, hot spotting. Uh, so there's no one size fits all solution in terms of write, read fan in and write fan out uh, and use variable TTLs in your caching layer to trade off freshness for capacity. Um, the last area is uh, looking at a low capacity for f low latency for a global user base. So one thing really clear is that this is not a social, this is not a social specific problem. This is a problem that lots of people have. Um, but one of the things that I was considering was, you know, like could we potentially use geographic partitioning to make this problem better? Um, you know, can you tie your data to the user and that the, the users to their location? It turns out that while most graph edges in your social network are local, um, that's not enough. Uh, the connections that are formed locally tend to spread out over time. And so at any given time when we were requesting data, most of the data is satisfied in some local area, but you basically always go out and you pay the latency penalty. So geographic uh, uh, sharding was really not effective. And so what was effective? Well, you know, the, the usual bag of tricks was effective. Um, latency hiding and um, making sure you had a, a, your data as mutable as possible and pushing it to the edge in a CDN. So uh, I, I just covered that. So in summary, um, I talked about scalability, virality, and, and low latency for a, a global user base. Um, scaling is, is really about needing to know what's efficient, what, what's consistent, and what's not. Uh, uh, data storage layer hotspotting is about um, picking the right read fan in, right fan out, uh, and handling virality through, through caching a, a variable cache TTLs. And low latency is, is about uh, not uh, walking down the path of, of geographic partitioning in general. Um, and one thing that the theme that comes up in all of these is that uh, making your data layer, layer immutable is, uh, is incredibly valuable. Uh, and with that, I've used uh, basically all the time. All the time, there's about one minute uh, if anyone has a question. Otherwise, I'll be happy to uh, uh, meet with folks after the talk.